there's something we all crave. Control. It can be as small as what you eat for breakfast or dinner, but it can also become more substantial. With time, we become accustomed to control over what happens in our lives, and when we lose it, it is devastating. When things change, we lose control of everything we'd planned. Things like having to come to work on your day off, to much more traumatic events like losing a loved one. It's moments like these that remind us we're not as in control as we think we are. It's like getting slapped in the face by reality, like a bucket of cold water being poured over our heads, bringing us back down to earth. It's frightening to lose control. And in this video, I'll explain how one of the most controversial, profitable, and well-known horror films of all time reflected that feeling perfectly. This is The Exorcist, 50 years later. This film had an incredibly slow start. For about the first 12 to 15 minutes, there's very little dialogue, and normally that would turn me away, but in this film it just works. I found myself being much more captivated than I'd expected, holding on to every little word that was said. The absence of that dialogue ended up giving it more weight later on. One scene that I really enjoyed came in around the 14 minute mark. Reagan's mother, Chris, is filming a part for an upcoming film that seems to have a focus on some kind of anti-war message. Now, of course, the Vietnam War was still being fought at the time of this film's release, though from what I understand, America had all but pulled out at that point. This scene caught my attention for two reasons. I first thought it was a subtle way for the director of the film, William Friedkin, to voice his protest of the war. Creative media has long since been a form of expression, even if it is subtle. I don't want to speak on his behalf, as it could be totally coincidental, that's just how I interpreted it. Now, that wasn't the only message I pulled from this. In times of war, many debate whether or not it's worth us getting involved, but when the US decides to, they need a good enough reason to justify it. The biggest reason to go to war? To defend your country and the beliefs that you hold dear. In times of war, we believe that those values, our freedoms, are being held at gunpoint, no pun intended. I feel as if that same idea could be a parallel to what happens to Reagan in the film, in reference to the possession and the exorcism. This demon, Pazuzu, literally invades Reagan. It takes her over, strips her of her innocence in a way we'll talk about later, and causes her to lash out. She acts violently and irrationally, and her mother cannot wrap her head around why. Before all that, though, the film makes you come to your own conclusions about demonic possession by only giving you a little bit at a time. It begins with a scene with Damien, where he's speaking with Tom about a job involving what we can assume is some case of demonic possession. The two go back and forth for some time before Damien makes the comment, It's more than psychiatry, and you know that, Tom. Some of their problems come down to faith their vocation, the meaning of their lives, and I can't cut it anymore. Tom simply stares back at Damien in silence before the scene ends with Damien saying, I think I've lost my faith, Tom. From the start, we're given a main character who seems to want to take a more scientific approach, but worries that even that won't help to fix what's wrong with these people. That mention of losing faith could mean a faith in medicine just as much as it does religion. Many people see themselves reflected in this character, someone who has devoted their lives to the church only to take a step back and think about things a little too critically. It's only then you begin to question your beliefs, and like Damien, you lose faith in it. As far as losing faith in medicine, many who have mental disorders have an incredibly difficult time getting on the correct medication and dosage. Those with the bipolar, BPD, schizophrenia, PTSD, and other ailments like it sometimes never get the right medication or dosage. That leads to a distrust or a severe doubt in the power of those things. In the end, Damien's character is one that a lot of us see ourselves in, and it helps the film become more grounded in reality while dealing with something completely out of this realm. And Damien isn't the only character we see ourselves in. 
In a different but not so different way, many people find themselves reflected in Reagan as well. In a scene immediately following the one we just touched on, we learn that not only are Reagan's parents separated, they seem to have had an incredibly rocky relationship. We see Reagan listening in on her mother's conversation, learning that her father won't be joining her on her birthday. It's a situation far too many can relate to. This also acts as one of the earliest references of not being in control. Many children of divorced parents feel as though it's their fault, even though it isn't. Reagan feels like she should have done something to help out her parents, but in the end, she just had no control over it. We'll touch more on Reagan and her having lack of control in the next chapter, but I wanted to end this one off by talking about her mother, Chris. Just like the last two characters, Chris is another incredibly relatable one. She's a hardworking mom who has gained the privilege of being fairly well off and being able to provide for her child just about everything Reagan could need she could have within the hour. But not everything. It's debatable what is the most important thing to a parent when it comes to their child, but I think it goes without saying that their safety is one of the most important ones. In this film, we see a woman have that power, the power to keep their child safe, ripped from them. I'm not a parent, and just the idea of that alone sends chills up my spine. It's one of the scariest parts of the film. It starts small with Reagan getting into her mom's bed because hers was shaking. Her mom writes it off as nothing, but later we and her mother are shown how violent this shaking can become. It's putting her child in danger, and the worst part about it all is that it can't be explained. All of these things I've mentioned tie into my interpretation of the film being ultimately about losing control, and in the next chapter I'll go into further detail, scene by scene, and explain why I've come to that conclusion. The first obvious instance of loss of control comes from the divorced parents we already touched on. We talked about how Reagan felt like she could have helped in the end, but it was impossible to change anything. It's a perfect example, sure, but I believe there was another scene we touched on that comes before it that expresses someone going against your wishes, and that scene is the anti-war protest. No one truly wants to go to war at the end of the day, but as citizens, we really have no say in whether or not we do. We can stand outside government buildings, hold up signs, scream at the top of our lungs, and march in the street, but war is something that we have no control over and no authority over. There are obviously some real-world examples I can pull from here, but for the sake of keeping this video about the film, let's move on to the next scene that caught my attention. When I saw this happen in the film, I was shocked. You have to remember, this was the first time I'd watched this movie, and while it had been heavily parodied in things like Scary Movie 2, I was genuinely taken aback by seeing it. It was uncomfortable, and you can sense that discomfort from looking at everyone's reaction to what's happening. That tension is only heightened when Reagan, or rather whatever is possessing Reagan, says, you're going to die up there. That tension only carries to the next scene, never really dissipating when Reagan is back in her bed. Her mother's beside her, trying her best to comfort her, but Reagan asks a question that shows that while she may not always be in the driver's seat, she knows something is wrong. Reagan says, what's wrong with me? It's heartbreaking because her mother, and as we later see, the doctors can't seem to find out exactly what is happening with this little girl. Speaking of doctors, the scenes in the hospital are another great example of being taken advantage of. A lot of us have an aversion to hospitals, and I believe part of it comes from a place of not necessarily distrust, but rather a place of vulnerability. Hospitals are generally an uncomfortable place to be, and that is shown in Reagan's actions through these scenes. 
She doesn't want to be there. She doesn't want to have all these tests done on her, even though she may believe they'll help her in the long run. But with how uncomfortable hospitals make me, the scene following this was one I was not prepared for. Similar to the urination scene, this one had been parodied time and time again until I thought it would lose all impact. I was wrong. I wasn't ready for just how violent and visceral this scene was. It makes it all the more horrifying when you learn that the actress suffered some pretty serious injuries filming this scene. Paired with the terrifying convulsions, this is one of the first times we truly see the demon take over Reagan. In a show of subtle but incredible special effects, a large knot forms in Reagan's throat. Shortly after, she strikes one of the doctors before screaming absolutely obscene things at him. I feel confident in saying that this is likely one of the scenes that caused some people to walk out. It's vile. It's disturbing, and to some, it was totally unneeded. To veer off topic a little, I want to mention how many felt the undertones of pedophilia and sexual assault were simply there for shock value, and really, it was. Especially in the later scene, including the crucifix, which I can't show here for various reasons. That would probably be my biggest problem with the film. I know it was meant to shock the viewers, but that can be done in ways that don't involve one of the most horrific crimes known to man. Simply hurting Reagan as a character by having her convulse on the bed, being scratched by the demon we can't see, I feel like that would have sufficed. Hell, later in the film when Reagan is fully possessed and her life is literally being drained from her and she looks emaciated, thin, and on the brink of death, that was plenty disturbing. The inclusion of these acts, especially when the character and the actress are underage, is unsettling and uncomfortable. I could go on for days about plenty of films that add these things to their stories for no other reason than to get people talking about it, and obviously it works, but that's another conversation to be had. We won't dwell on the crucifix scene much longer, but there is one instance of Reagan lashing out that fits the context of the overarching theme that I noticed. After the demon does what it does with the crucifix, it then forces Reagan to fight her mother, pushing her so hard she sent flying across the room into the floor. That, in my mind, is a complete and total loss of control, especially paired with everything that took place in the few scenes leading up to it. We've seen Reagan attack doctors and lash out at others at this point, but to cause physical harm to her mother, her caretaker, the one that she leans on the most, it's on another level. And what makes it so much more horrifying is that it isn't really Reagan. It's scary to imagine how much she can see from behind the eyes of this demon. It's also worth mentioning here that the actress who played Chris, Ellen Bernstein, sustained a pretty severe injury while filming this scene. As a matter of fact, the shot in the film is the one where she suffered that injury. Her scream of pain is genuine. Finally, we're going to talk about the climax of the film and the actual exorcism and close the book on this movie for good. There is a lot that can be said about this scene, but I'm just going to focus on the biggest things that caught my attention. Firstly, the special effects in this final scene are incredible. For a film that's turning 50 this December, seeing the skin peel off Reagan, seeing her teeth being bright yellow and looking as if they're going to fall out, it's unsettling. Couple that with the beautifully spooky lighting of everything and the breath pouring from everyone, it just works. I'm sure many of you already know, but the room where this scene was filmed was kept well below freezing. Everyone on set was dressed in numerous layers to stay warm. Everyone except Linda Blair, the woman who played Reagan. That thin little nightgown is all she was given for this scene, and you can see it perfectly in the next part of the scene that I love so much. Seeing Reagan lift from the bed like that, her eyes completely white, is one of the most iconic shots of the film, and for a good reason. It's so wonderfully executed and serves as a perfect example of how much Pazuzu controls this poor little girl. 
Of course, the priests manage to bring Reagan back down to Earth, and while the exorcism is far from over, we can see the effect it had on Damien. The mention of a loss of faith at the beginning is a lost thought now. He's seen firsthand what the powers of hell can have over our world, and there's no way to deny it. The demon is powerful, much more powerful than I think either priest was expecting, and we get a perfect example of its power when Damien returns to Reagan's room and sees his mother sitting on the bed. Obviously, we know it isn't his mother, and Damien knows that as well, but the fact that Bazuzu is able to make Damien see things like this is a testament to its power. Furthermore, as we'll see when we talk about the ending, Pazuzu takes over Damien. Before that comes the vision of Damien's mother that I just mentioned. She's very ill and on the brink of death asking why, why? It's followed up with Damien's mother's voice coming through Reagan, speaking directly to him. It's so unsettling and honestly heartbreaking. I believe Damien feels some sort of guilt for his mother's passing, which is why the demon latched onto it so heavily. Damien was so affected by it, the exorcist allowed him to leave the room without question. Before he does, though, he tells him that they can save Reagan, but she'll be in a coma. It's shortly after this when the film shocked me the most. Believe it or not, even with this film being 50 years old in December, I'd never had the ending spoiled for me. In the conversations I've had about it, even doing research for this film, no one has mentioned it. I think it was overshadowed by the controversy and crassness of some of the previous scenes we touched on, and it's a shame because the ending is one of the best parts of the film. And I don't mean that in a, oh my gosh, it's finally over kind of way, but in a real way. Seeing Damien convince Pazuzu to go into him, nearly take him over completely, but fight it off at the last second and then throw himself out of the window, it was incredible. It shows that his loss of faith, and maybe in turn his belief in himself, have all but dissipated. He was now confident and strong enough to take on the power of an actual demon, fight through the persuasion of it, gain control of his body, and take the demon out for good, even if it meant killing himself in the process. But the beauty of it is that he was the one who did it, not the demon. And as I've said this whole time, having control is the most important thing to us because when we have it, we're nearly unstoppable. I just wanna say thank you so, so much for listening and watching this video. I hope I provided a stance or an opinion on this film that hasn't been played out or said before, at least in some sense of the way or sense of the word, you know, uh, given that the movie is 50 years old, I, there's probably someone out there who has talked about the film in this light, but it's, it's just something I really wanted to talk about because I'd never seen the film. This was my first time watching it and it hit me in such a strange way. I had the hardest time coming up with how to talk about this film like, was I just going to make it a review, or was I going to talk about a specific thing, or was I going to treat it like the Blair Witch video? And I think the way I handled it is, it, it works for me, and I think that's kind of all that matters, because I'm, I'm happy with it at the end of the day, and I think it's an interesting enough analysis, I'll say, to where someone who has never seen it, or maybe someone who loves it, can look at this and see the movie maybe in a different light because that's how it felt to me I, it felt like I was looking at the movie in a completely different way than I'd ever really looked at a movie before I know a lot of movies have overarching themes but horror movies are ones that people tend to push to the side and don't really think twice about people think horror movies are just there to scare you but I think it's more than that and this film kind of kind of just took that and ran with it. Of course, the, the theme of not being in control is, it's all over the place in horror films, you know, but this, this film specifically used the idea of possession to make it the forefront of the film, and I think it just absolutely 
shined in that regard. I don't really do movie ratings. I think they're a little silly. If I had to give this movie a rating, it would honestly be like maybe a maybe like a 7 out of 10 or a 3 out of 5. It was a great film, but I think there was there was the inclusion of certain things that just made me very uncomfortable and didn't feel incredibly necessary. I don't think I need to exactly explain what that was, but I will stop babbling now and just say thank you again for listening. I hope you enjoyed and um, give me some more movie recommendations in the comments. I would love to look at another horror movie, maybe a Japanese horror film or a Korean horror film. Um, those have always freaked me the hell out. So thanks again so much for listening. I hope you all have a wonderful night, day, or afternoon, wherever you are. Take care of yourselves and each other, and try not to get possessed. I want to give a quick thank you to all my $5 patrons and members, Absinthe, Alice, Alice E., Amethyst, Amet, Caroline, Christina Smith, CT, Deborah Tychus, Elizabeth Watkins, LSG, Furious Weasel, If In Doubt, Flat Out, Jesse Jess Jess, Justinia Zaromsky, Karen Parrott, Kat, Kathy Fanning, Lee Riggs, Lindsay Pruitt, Melody Evans, Melissa Berwick, Mindy Bannon, Moon Potato, Nicholas Moore, Nikki Parsons, Nora, Nova Nocturne, Patricia Rodea, Ray Clegg, Centennial, The New Ongoing 24, Tiger Princess, Triumph, and Victoria Step. Thank you all for the continued support. I really, really appreciate it. Take care of yourselves.